Hey everyone, um, welcome again to um, Digital Church. Uh, I know this isn't what we're used to, but during this time, um, this is how we're going to be trying to communicate with you guys. Um, so looking forward to sharing the word with you guys, um, praying for you guys, praying that you guys stay safe um, throughout this time and that you guys are able to get the things that you need and, and also stay connected. Um, Praying also um, just for our mental health in this time because it is hard to not be connecting with other people and I really wish uh, we could be in person. But at any rate, um, last week in high school, um, and we're just going to be kind of continuing the high school lessons for right now, but um, last week in high school, Lucy taught about Philippians chapter 1 verses 1 through 26. So when we were first preparing to teach that week, we actually identified one main idea in that text that I think actually applies way more now than it did before the coronavirus hit. So I actually first was writing some of my notes to pass on to Lucy on March 6th, so just a little over two weeks ago, and it didn't seem like a huge big deal yet. Um, so the message wasn't fully tailored to the situation that we now find ourselves in. But Paul was writing at that time to Philippians who were in a situation that they did not think was good and that they thought was gonna be bad for the church specifically. So, you know, maybe not all that different than us, even if it's a different problem. Because their situation, it wasn't a global pandemic that made us all stand six feet away from each other if we actually ever do live, leave our house, right? Or go into a panic anytime anyone thinks about coughing near us. Instead, their situation was that their leader, Paul, was in jail, which was a dishonorable thing to them. And honor was the most important thing in their culture just like comfort is probably the most important thing in our culture. And right now, if we're honest, we're not that comfortable. Like, sure, you might be sitting on a couch or doing whatever. Maybe you're in your pajamas and normally you wouldn't be at church. But it's not really a comfortable situation overall, right? Just to sit on your couch and hear that there are hundreds and thousands of people getting sick with this virus and we don't know when it's going to go away. But in the same way, I think we can apply the truth that, that Paul was speaking to the Philippians, to our situation. So we can look for the ways that God's continuing to work in our wor world and then rejoice in what God is actually doing. Because God doesn't just go away uh, when there's a coronavirus, right? He's, he's acting and, and many people um, are probably taking God much more seriously than they have in a long time. So it might look like it's a defeat for God because we're not in a building worshiping together but it honestly is a huge opportunity for us. Like um, for many of you, um, you finally have that rarest thing in our culture, that thing called time, time. Like one thing that discipleship to Jesus takes is time, right? We have to spend time with him for to be truly following Jesus, we give him our time. And so let's take advantage during this time of social distancing, this where we have this gift of time, Let's use it for discipleship rather than just using it for fear or even just for entertainment. And then even more than just having time, honestly, most of you probably have families that you can talk about this, this stuff with, this Bible stuff, not just the coronavirus stuff, but I mean the lessons. And even if you don't have that, you have people like me who could reach out to you in order to talk about this. So while it seems like this could be an impossible challenge for a place like our church, it doesn't really need to get in the way of God's momentum in your lives. In fact, just like Paul's imprisonment prompted, created a new possibility of growth for, for his people, this might really be a good time for you to grow in your own faith. So now that I've um, caught the middle school students up to speed just a little bit um, with the what we talked about last week, I'm gonna transition into this week's topic. So this week, we're going to be talking about something that might seem a little difficult in our current context where we're all isolated in our own homes um, because we're going to talk about becoming the kind of people that we need to be in order to have unity. Okay, so in the best of times, it's hard to have unity and it's hard to be this kind of person um, that we're going to talk about. And we obviously aren't in the best of times, right? We're in honestly the worst times that I can remember, at least in a lot of ways. And it's definitely the hardest times to seem united. I, the most difficult time for our nation that I remember was right after 9-11. And after 9-11 happened, we had amazing shows of unity where all the members of Congress got together and saying amazing grace. Um, 
who they're not doing that now, right? They're not, they're trying to avoid being near each other. So it seems harder to get, get unity. And I mean, all of us are probably new to this um, and we all are in this, but we're all in this separately or in a best case scenario, we're all in this six feet apart. So it's like we would be singing that high school musical song, we're all in this separately, separated by six feet for social distancing. Anyway, that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, but I think that um, we can still build, be people who build unity during this time because it can start in your own family and you're still around them. And we can be united in the ways that we digitally connect with one another. So without further ado, let's open up to Philippians 127, and we're actually going to read through the end of chapter 2. Okay, reading from Philippians uh, 127 through the end of chapter 2. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Um, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice, sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I, may, I too may be cheer, cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me, and I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Okay, so that um, was the word of the Lord from uh, Philippians 127 to the end of chapter 2 of Philippians. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about this 
there's a lot of things that actually seem oddly similar to situations that we're facing right now. Um, even just little things, like when it says um, to continue obeying even in the absence of Paul, well, obviously I'm not physically present with you and we're experiencing that absence. Or um, it, Epaphroditus, um, that servant who, who nearly dies from illness. That's again, something that you know, I don't think has happened to anyone, anyone in our churches yet because of the coronavirus, but it's, it seems like something that could happen. But regardless of that, those similarities, I want to start where this passage starts off, with a command to live a life worthy of the gospel, which leads to an important question and an important answer to that question. So the important question is just how do we live in a way that's worthy of the gospel of Christ? And we do that by following Jesus' example of humility, which will lead us to unity. But first, we need to talk about what it means to be worthy, because some of you guys might not really know that word. It's not a word that we use a lot in our culture. Basically, it means to be deserving of something. So like Thor and, and also Captain America, they're, they're worthy to lift Thor's hammer, if you guys remember that from the Avengers movies. But basically what Paul is telling the people of Philippi is that they should be deserving of the good news about Jesus. So kind of as a side note, first, it's not because they could ever earn their salvation that they would be worthy of this. But basically, once we are saved, we should live our life in a way that reflects our desire to be like Jesus. So we're never going to actually deserve to be saved. That's not, not something that we can attain. But we can try to live in a way that we would deserve salvation, even if we could never do it on our own without God first saving us and without us first initially not being deserving of it at all, it at all. But then Paul quickly explains that the key to being worthy is to be united because we need to have one faith. And then he tells us that we need to be of one mind and have the same love. He goes on and on about the oneness or the sameness of things because the idea is that when we're united together, that's when we're worthy to be saved. Because when we're united like that, that's when we're really the church or the body of Christ. And that makes sense because what God, when he saves people, he saves them as part of the church. He saves the church and all who are truly part of the church. So just as a side note, that means people who are truly a part of, of God's church and truly God's followers. So not necessarily everyone who goes into a church building is really a part of the church. And there might be some people who, for one reason or another, don't go to church buildings, um, but are still a part of the church. I mean, right now, obviously, we're all not going to church buildings um, because of, of this coronavirus. And that doesn't mean that we are disunited from the church itself. So, but in order to really do that, in order to really be united, we have to consider other people more important than ourselves. So what Paul tells us to do is to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, which basically means don't do anything just to make yourself look good. Think of other people as being more important than yourself. So Paul isn't saying not to take care of yourself at all, but he's saying don't compete in trying to have the most honor. Remember, honor was the most important thing to the Philippians. That was their highest goal, is to be the most honored person. In our culture, that's usually not our highest value. We're not usually trying to attain the highest level of honor. In our culture, usually we're trying to attain the highest level of comfort. And in the same way, we don't want to try to get the highest level of comfort. So right now, that obviously means something different than normal, right? It's um, it's easy for us to go into a bit of a frenzy because there are shortages of things. Like for the first time in my life, I've had to think, oh, if I buy that, then maybe somebody else will need that right now and they won't get it. And everyone else is also thinking about that. I remember standing in line, talking with people going into the grocery store a few days ago, and we're all going like, okay, so how much do we get? And... Um, oh, wait, don't hoard too much because then someone else might not even get food, and that would be a big problem. And so we have a lot of people freaking out because we're confronted with, with a situation that we've never really prepared for or thought about. So in the midst of this um, difficult situation where things are a little bit different than normal, it's, it's, it's pretty hard, right? So like, for example, like there's no more toilet paper, right? No more around. And... That's kind of weird because there's actually a normal amount of toilet paper being made and going into all the stores. It's just that because people are freaking out and a few jokes were made a while back about how there's not going to be enough toilet paper, 
Suddenly, everyone is buying out Costco and every other store supplies just to try to get toilet paper. So we have people who want the comfort of knowing, you know, that they can uh, wipe, hoarding like hundreds of rolls of toilet paper. Like seriously, like if you think you're going to need 100 rolls to get you through coronavirus um, before this thing is over, honestly, you probably should have gone to the doctor a while ago to talk about the problems that you're having, right? You've got digestive issues. Um, but um, for the rest of us, you know, we might just not have none and, and need to get some in order to uh, take care of things hygienically, right? Um, so I'd like to challenge um, any of the, any of you guys whose families have way more than enough toilet paper right now or some other supply that's, that's scarce to text me what you have too much of. And if you're a family that's in need of, of toilet paper or some other supply, Text me that too, and maybe I can match people up, okay? And we can arrange for those with the extra to give to those who are in need. It's a very practical way to consider the comfort of someone else above others. But that said, in this time, it's it's also practical to want to stock up a little bit so that we don't have to go to the store quite as often since suddenly it's considered a risk to go to the store. Right? Like I, I went on Monday and um, had a lady sneeze within my six feet of social distancing because she was like walking by me down the aisle, right? And she just sneezes and doesn't cover it. And so I'm like, oh no, what's gonna happen, right? I'm just sitting at home waiting like, okay, anytime in the next two weeks, I could develop a fever and who knows what could happen, right? So it's kind of just like sitting out here waiting for the worst to possibly happen. Not that that's all that I'm thinking about, but it's kind of like, it's, it is a real thing all of a sudden. Um, anyway, so, all that to say is it's okay to have some extra so that your family doesn't um, need to go out when it is somewhat dangerous to go out. Um, but in the midst of that, your family also has the chance to look out for the needs and comforts of others. So maybe your family has extra or something like that, and it can find ways that it can help someone else or take care of your grandparents or somebody like that. Um, so maybe talk with your, your parents about ways that you could do that, ways that you guys as, as hopefully healthier, younger people can take care of those who really do need need some help in this time. And even honestly, if you can't get groceries for someone in need, because maybe someone in your family has something like asthma or an um, immune disorder where, you know, they're actually at higher risk. So you, you really want to be careful for their sake. Um, you can still be a point of encouragement for others. Because honestly, I think in this time, we probably all need some encouragement. Um, so send them something that you find enjoyable and, and be an encouragement to that other person, right? You probably got extra time on your hands. So why not pick a few people that you want to brighten the days of instead of just trying to figure out, okay, what do I want to do right now? Do I want to just watch another movie or whatever? Actually, take the time to make a phone call. I know normally a lot of us communicate by text message and that's, that's great because we also see people face to face. Um, but now it might be a great time to not just text, but to actually FaceTime or um, do some sort of video chat just to get as close as we can to really seeing other people. Um, but remember the goal with that is to consider other people more important than yourself. For the people in Philippi, that attitude meant considering how to honor people more and to make sure that other people got the respect that they deserve. That was the important thing for them because that was their number one goal. For us, I think that means looking for ways to make sure that other people are comfortable. Not because comfort is the most important thing, any, any more than honor was the most important thing for actually for, with them, but because when we give up what our culture thinks is the most important, like honor or, or um, comfort, then we're acknowledging that there's actually something else that's more important, and that's our unity in Christ. But what we do need to do is we need to, to follow Christ's example that's what we need to do in the midst of this situation. So, uh, so since uh, we're wanting to follow Christ's example, let's read more about who Jesus truly is and what his example was like. So I'm going to start in chapter 2, verse 5, and reread that. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of man and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow 
in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So it's this passage starts by reminding us that Jesus, before he was even born, was in the form of God, which means that he was God. He had it all. In their context, all honor was his. And in ours, all comfort was his, right? God, he, in reality, he had both, all honor, all comfort, because heaven is a place where you experience, where, where, where God has all the honor and all the comfort that he could ever want, right? And all of anything else too, anything else that he would want. But he decided not to keep those things that he had. He didn't grasp onto them, that status or that thing, anything, but he sacrificed by becoming a person and then becoming a person who would die on a cross, which for the Philippians, that was the most dishonorable thing imaginable. And honestly, for us, it's, it's probably the most uncomfortable thing imaginable too, um, to go through that. That's a huge amount of sacrifice that Jesus went through. And then what we see at the end though, is that after that, he gets exalted and gets the highest name so that every knee will bow. He gets the most honor of anyone. People and angels bow before him and confess that he is Lord. And that means he's going to get back everything he gave up. And, and in some ways, maybe he gets even more. I'm not sure if we can say that God gets even more honor after the crucifixion or not. But if that's possible for God to get more honor than what he already had, then I think Jesus did it. And I think that same pattern is true for us as well. Uh, when we decide to give a little comfort right now or a little honor or a little whatever because we realize the needs of others are more important than our own or because we know that we need to give something up for the sake of unity, we go through our own like mini crucifixion. Not as big of a deal, not as dramatic, um, but one day we're going to be rewarded beyond what we originally sacrificed. For us, it'll be worth it and it'll grow beyond our original quote unquote investment. Although here's the thing, I don't think we're necessarily going to be rewarded if all we're really trying to do is help ourselves in the long run, like, because God knows our motives and so we should mostly be motivated by trying to help others. But we should also rest in the fact that, hey, I am sacrificing, but I care about this other person and God is going to take care of me. I think that's what we need to remember. So anyway, and then Paul reminds us that in the midst of this, we should, um, do it even when Paul is not there, and we should work out our, our faith with fear and trembling. Um, well, that kind of actually resonates with us a little bit, right? Right now we're experiencing a time of absence and maybe a time where we're afraid. Um, so even though I'm not with you, it's your job to keep growing in your faith. But it might seem weird to talk about working out our faith with fear and trembling. Like, why would we be afraid, especially if we're going to be saved? What What's the place of fear in that? Well, a short answer to that question might be just that I'm not totally sure why God tells us to be afraid or to work out our faith in fear and trembling. Because since we don't have to worry about hell, it doesn't seem like we should be afraid. And, that, and a lot of us probably thought that was part of the point of believing in Jesus, was that we don't have to be afraid of things like hell. But it turns out that we should know the seriousness of this, right? We need to know that the faith of Jesus required him to be crucified. And our sacrifices for the sake of others will sometimes require scary sacrifice. Like if our example of looking out for the interests of others is crucifixion, well then working out our faith and imitating that, that probably would make us scared. Uh, we can see that helping another human being might, uh, might put us at risk. Like especially right now in a season where we're in where there's the coronavirus, helping someone else might actually be a little bit risky. Um, kind of like it was for Jesus, probably not quite as risky as him. Um, but we need to be the kind of people who are taking risks for others. Now, that said, not unnecessary risks, because right now taking unnecessary risks, quote unquote, for the sake of others, would probably just be putting people in danger. So don't hear me saying this and then decide, hey, I'm going to go run outside and just go around and cough on people and touch them and stuff. No, that's putting other people's lives at risk. Um, so what I'm saying, though, is that we should know that Jesus or, and God will sometimes call us into scary acts of obedience and scary acts of caring for others. And that's what Jesus had to do himself. And in the midst of that, it tells us not to grumble or complain. Um, just be a light to those around us, which, which is hard, right? Uh, sometimes we might sacrifice, but grumble about it. 
Um, and in the midst of that, it tells us to shine like stars. So we need to let people know about our Christian faith and what that means and that we're willing to give to those who are in need, even though we don't know what's going to happen right now. We just keep giving and keep sacrificing, keep helping those we know. And then finally, we get some examples of how to live beyond just the example of Jesus. Okay, we see, it talks about Timothy, who seeks the good of Christ, and Epaphroditus, who was a messenger sent by the Philippians to Paul, who nearly died of an illness along the way. But he was able to keep going probably after recovering and delivered the message to Paul. And, and after recovering, he, he was able to go back to the Philippians. Um, so these were examples of people who had the attitude of looking out for the interests of God rather than their own personal interests. They, they weren't just looking at what it was in it for them. Um, so it was something um, that they could do. It wasn't just Paul wasn't just saying, hey, be Jesus and be crucified. He was saying, like, no, just be like Jesus, ultimately. But also take as examples um, Timothy and Epaphroditus. Um, and so, like, even in our own church, like, you, you might have heard that, you know, like, Eric Osborne is, uh, and a number of people along with him, are willing to go out and buy groceries for, for the elderly. Um, and that's taking a little bit of risk for themselves in order to serve other people. So anyway, my encouragement to you this time is to be worthy of the gospel. That means that we should pursue unity by taking the humble example of sacrificial giving like Jesus, or finding ways to care for someone more than just caring for yourself. And honestly, that's all we got to do. And that can be as simple as a phone call or a video chat, or it can be helping to get groceries or helping around your house with your parents because you're kind of stuck there with them. Maybe you can help cook or clean, um, whatever it is. Try to find a way that you can help out and build unity uh, with the people that you're with or and with the people that you wish you were with, um, that, that you can't be with physically. And so for families that are, that are watching this and want to have a discussion, or for people um, who are going to join in any kind of digital discussion that we have with this, here's some questions that I want us to talk about. So number one, why do you think it is so important to look out for the interests of others? Number two, how does Jesus' example inspire you to care for others? Number three, why do you think that sacrificial giving is so important for unity? And number four, what actions can you take during this week to practice this? Remember, we don't know what's going on for this week, um, but as best as, as best as you're able, try to figure out what we might be able to do. So again, those questions are, why do you think it is so important to look out for the interests of others? How does Jesus' example inspire you to care for others? Why do you think that sacrificial giving is so important for unity? And what actions can you take during this week to practice this? Thank you guys. Uh, looking forward to when this is all over and we're able to see each other again. Um, God bless, and I'm praying for you.